Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. As producers get their seed in the ground over the next few weeks, there are concerns about weeds, especially coming out of two years of drought. Joining us now is Angela Post, our new Extension Weed Science Specialist. Angela, welcome to Oklahoma State. Yes, thank you, and you're absolutely right. As we come out of this drought, um, we're seeing that over the last two years, um, when our crops were starting to suffer in the summer, we had many producers who abandoned their normal weed management practices. And as they moved into the fall and in the spring, we've seen a lot more seed um, get into the seed bank. And so as we go into planting this fall, there are gonna be concerns for those weeds that we had go into the seed bank. And in terms of weed management with this in mind, what kind of things are producers concerned about and especially this time of year? Yeah, so this time of year, we're really thinking about wheat and canola planting. Many um, growers who are gonna be uh, planting canola are either already started or have their, their last tillage pass or last burn down um, on the ground for that. And uh, if you haven't already gotten your last burn down on for canola, the only option you really have at this point is a glyphosate application to get those um, fall emerging weeds and what we're really talking about here is mare's tail and some of our fall annual winter annuals grasses. Um, for wheat we still have a little bit of time to get a, a burn down application out or a last tillage pass in if you haven't already and for that we can look at glyphosate plus sharpen or we can also look at uh, glyphosate plus dicamba. Um, dicamba we're getting just a tiny bit late on. Uh, you need 10 days for every quarter pound of active ingredient um, <clears throat> between application and planting time for wheat and so it's important for growers to be thinking about that. Okay and obviously a big question you get is those herbicide resistant weeds. Any advice there? Yeah so um, especially as you drive around this uh, summer we're seeing a lot of uh, herbicide resistant mare's tail in our soybean fields. That's going to also show up in many of our wheat and canola fields. Um, the mare's tail is starting to emerge now. Um, it's also the summer ones are going into seed and uh, please remember that uh, as I continue in uh, as the extension weed specialist here, we're gonna be continuing our herbicide resistance testing. So if you see that you have a herbicide resistance problem, uh, make sure and plan to collect seed for that and send it in through your area agronomist or your county extension educator um, into our offices so that we can test it for you. Okay, and obviously answer those questions more specifically for the producers. Sure. Okay, Angela Post, our new Extension Weed Science Specialist. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Right, thank you. With the uh, rainfall that we've had over the eastern two-thirds of Oklahoma this summer, many cow-calf producers in that area are beginning to think about saving back some replacement heifers and perhaps uh, growing their cow herd back to a, a more normal size. So if you've got some uh, replacement heifers that are going to be calving next spring, now is a good time to evaluate what kind of body condition those heifers are in so that they're in good shape at calving time next spring. We've often talked about having those two-year-old heifers at about 85 percent of their mature weight at calving time, but most of us don't have the capability or the scales on our property in order to keep checking those weights to make sure that they're at that 85% target weight. But we all have the capability of looking at the heifers and watching them closely throughout the course of the fall and winter and early spring and until they do calve. So the target that we want those heifers to be in at calving time is a body condition score six on a one through nine scale. On the screen, you'll see an example of a Hereford heifer that I think does a good job of giving you that example of a heifer in that particular body condition score. If you look at, this, at the slide, you can see that you cannot find any of the ribs. If you have a much thinner heifer, you would see the outline of at least the last two ribs on a rib cage, and if she was very thin, perhaps even more than that. Also, you cannot see any of the transverse processes those bones that would stick out right in front of the hip bone along the edge of the loin. In the case of a body condition score four or three heifer, those would be very, very prominent. So as you're looking at the heifers this fall and winter, see if you can start to make sure that your supplementation program is adequate 
So these heifers are gaining about a pound and a half a day and moving towards this blooming appearance like the heifer that we've shown on the screen today, that body condition score six. Then those heifers will be in the proper body condition to do a good job of providing the first milk, the colostrum for that baby calf, repair a reproductive tract, and cycle back to have a chance to rebreed to stay in sync then with the rest of the cow herd as they then get ready for their second calf. I think that's a good target to shoot for for these two-year-old heifers. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. We want to talk about pregnancy checks now as livestock producers gear up for fall. Joining us now is Dan Stein, our livestock reproduction specialist. And Dan, let's just start with the basics, determining whether or not a cow was pregnant. Okay, Lindell, it's kind of surprising. A study that was uh, uh, published in just a year ago stated that less than 20% of the producers even utilize any type of method to determine pregnancy in, in beef cattle. So uh, usually what a person does or a producer does will, will just be wait till the calf's born the next spring. However, that's not very economical to feed an open cow through the winter. So there are some methods, probably the most widely used method is that of uh, uh, rectal palpation. Rectal palpation is performed about um, usually between day 40 and 60. Um, you're pushing the limits uh, if you can palpate before day 40, say day 35, it takes a very skilled person to determine pregnancy by rectal palpation. Other methods, uh, we have an ultrasound that can be used. Uh, this can be used as early as day 28. Uh, if we wait till uh, about day 60 to 80 of gestation, we can go ahead and uh, check the gender uh, of, the, of the fetus. And uh, this again is, needs to be done by uh, a veterinarian if we're going to use an ultrasound machine. We know in humans there are urine tests that are done pretty easily to determine pregnancy. Is this an option also in livestock? Well, at, at the present time, there's uh, not a metabolite that is uh, passed to the urine that we can test like we do, uh, that we have in humans. The HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, is the is the, what we are testing for in the human side of things. But there are some metabolites that we can uh, check for in the milk and the blood. We do have a progesterone assay that is performed or can be performed. Uh, progesterone levels can be monitored either in the milk or the blood. Uh, on a uh, cow, on a 21 day estrus cycle, if we test 21 days after either insemination or breeding, that animal, uh, if it has a, a low level of progesterone, we're very sure that that animal will not be bred because uh, progesterone being the pregnancy hormone needs to be maintained at least one, in, one nanogram per mil. Uh, on the other side of the coin, if we test it uh, day 21 and we do have a high progesterone level, that does not mean that that animal is for sure pregnant. So progesterone has a uh, very high negative predictive value, but it's questionable on a positive predictive value, meaning we, if uh, progesterone levels are low, then yes, she is open. If they are high, we may need to take, uh, check again to get a progesterone profile. Now on the beef side of things, that's not very, uh, really may not be an option to bring that cow in more than once to pull a series of, of um, tests for progesterone assays. On the dairy side of things, when we have that cow in the parlor twice a day, very simple to uh, get mm -hmm. monitor uh, progesterone in, in the milk. So again, progesterone can either be in the blood or, or the milk. Uh, there is some relatively new tests on the, uh, on the market today that test for a, uh, what we call a pregnancy specific glycoprotein in the blood. What it tests for is in ruminants, there is a specialized cell called the binucleate cell in, from the, it's transferred from the fetal side to the maternal side. And uh, with that uh, passes this uh, pregnancy specific glycoprotein and we're able, able to test for that in the blood. That can be done usually around day 28. Uh, and again, as far as predictability, uh, if there is, as far as a negative predictability, is very, very high, less than 1% as far as uh, on that. If, uh, if that specific protein is not there, then she is not pregnant. 
but we do have about a five to eight percent what we call false positives and that comes from the fact that again once we have that transferred into maternal blood we could still have an early embryonic loss and that protein is still showing in the blood so we can have a false positive due to the length of time that stays in the blood. We, we're here in the dairy barn. We've also talked about beef cattle. Are some of these techniques options for other animals as well? Well, we do use uh, we use uh, ultrasound on swine. We do use ultrasound on on uh, sheep and goats. Uh, the thing about these pregnancy uh, associated glycoproteins is that they are specific to ruminants. So again, that binucleate cell is uh, on the ruminant side and we do have those tests for, there's companies that have those tests for the sheep and goats, deer, as far as those ruminant animals uh, besides the uh, uh, beef cattle and dairy cattle. Okay, Dan Stein, great information on pregnancy testing livestock. We'll see you again soon. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. September is here, but where is the cooler weather? It's in the mornings. A map of nighttime lows from Wednesday morning shows that 30 Mesonet sites had lows in the 50s. El Reno bottomed out at 51 degrees. Wednesday afternoon, highs in the state ranged from 101 at Hooker in the Panhandle to 87 at J in the northeast corner of the state. With the rain becoming a distant memory, it may be time to pull out the watering hose. The estimated water need for most plants on Tuesday's map of evapotranspiration was running in the range of two tenths, the green map areas, to three tenths of an inch of water per day, the brown map areas. That means plants will use an inch of water in four to five days. September's warm days and cool nights are why we see a fall growth spurt. And yes, to make the most of that growth, plants need water from rain or irrigation. Here's Gary with an update on our lack of rain and its drought impact. Thanks, Al, and good morning, everybody. As usual, let's start with the latest U.S. Drought Monitor map. And I'm afraid the ongoing dry weather has forced some more changes in the drought monitor and not all for the good. In fact, all of those were on the dry side. We did see abnormally dry conditions, that's the yellow, uh, increase over northern Oklahoma. And we also had moderate to just generally abnormally dry conditions start to spread in southern Oklahoma. Well, why is that? Well, let's take a look back at August and I can show you exactly why. Uh, if we look at this uh, observed rainfall map from the Oklahoma Mesonet for the month of August, we can see some nice totals across the northern two-thirds of Oklahoma, but southern Oklahoma was really dry in comparison. In fact, some places had uh, two-tenths of an inch or less, so you know, good stuff up in northern Oklahoma for the most part and really dry down in south-central Oklahoma and also southeastern Oklahoma. If we take a look at the percentage of normal rainfall for August, well, the statewide average was three inches or so, about a quarter inch above normal, but the southern third of the state was down to 60% to even as low as 20% of normal. So you can see the real difference between southern Oklahoma and northern Oklahoma in this percentage of normal rainfall map for August. Now, how about for the future? Let's take a look at the U.S. Drought Monitor's Outlook page. This is from the Climate Prediction Center, and this is for the month of September. So this is what we would expect at the end of September. And as you can see, where there's drought in Oklahoma, they expect that to persist through the month of September. And they also have none developing over in the eastern two-thirds of the state uh, as we go a little bit north, but I'm not too sure I agree with that. I think we might see that drought persist and also start to spread east in those areas as well if we don't start to get good rainfall during the month of September. So there you have it, drought's on the move again. Uh, once that rainfall goes away and it gets hot, that's what generally happens here in Oklahoma in the summertime. So that's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report.
Joining us once again is our grain marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. Kim, as we look at the markets this week, soybeans really seem to be leading the way. Can you talk us through the, the action of the week? Well, earlier in the week, uh, soybeans were up 60 cents on trading one day. Of course, they closed down about 30 cents off the top, but still 29 cents higher for the day. Corn followed them up uh, relatively close. Uh, wheat uh, kind of a it slightly higher, but but didn't go up like the cor the corn did. Uh, the basic thing going on there is just weather. Okay. Now, this isn't really what we'd expect to see out of corn right now, since we've got such a supply. What's going on there? Yeah, if you look what's going on uh, you, out the the 2013-14 crop year. Uh, uh, soybean uh, stocks are expected to, to remain well below average. Uh, you've had weather problems with beans and they're lowering the, uh, the ec expected production and therefore they're starting to ra ration soybeans right now. Uh, corn, uh, we're looking at uh, ending stocks uh, 1.8 billion plus, going up from just over 700 million this year. S more than sufficient amounts of, of corn next year. But the underlying factor is the value of the land for corn and the value of the land for beans. And if that, that, that corn bean price ratio gets out of line, the market is concerned as you get out to the 14 crop that we're not going to have enough corn produced and have more beans. So that price relationship out in the future is still playing into, into effect. And of course, uh, wheat with the excitement in those other two markets, uh, wheat goes up a little bit, but nothing like happening corn and beans. Let's talk about the movement we really saw in wheat this week. What, what's happening there? Well, you know, wheat, uh, you go back a couple of weeks, we were talking about it's trading, trading in the bottom half of that sideways pattern between $6.93 to seven twenty six on that December contract. It's back down to that six ninety three dollars level. It's challenging that support price. If we break through that and we're, we trade below that six ninety three dollars on uh, next Monday or Tuesday, then I think we're down, good for another $0.30 cents down. All right, so then thinking for producers, we're looking at possibly going down. We also have a big WASDE report coming out next week. What kind of advice do you have for them? Well, you look at that WASDE report coming out next Thursday. That's an in a report, uh, important report. The big news is going to be on corn and beans, not wheat. If you wheat producers have uh, wheat in the bin and can't afford 30 or 40 cent lower prices, they probably are to sell some of it now. All right, good advice as always. Kim Anderson, the grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about battery maintenance for our cordless uh, drills and uh, impact wrenches and whatnot. Okay, so you've got a, a nickel uh, battery that for your cordless uh, tool, and so there are some things you can do to help make them last longer. One of them is if they're hot, don't recharge them while they're hot. Another is that you don't want to let them fully discharge for a couple of times but eventually you'll have to discharge them completely or they they get what's called memory. So once the battery develops some memory then it's only going to stay charged for that long. It'll only have that much space for a charge and so you'll want to uh, fully discharge it at that point and reset kind of reset its memory so it will last a little longer. And then for uh, the lithium batteries they don't get a memory. It's just the CAD batteries that you'll have that problem with. So the lithium batteries you don't have to worry about, but you still need to to maintain them as well. They're obviously never going to last forever. They have a limited lifespan, but maybe there are some things that you can do to, to help make them last a little longer. So there's a little tip on battery maintenance this week on Shop Stop. We'll see you next time. school back in session now, we want you to meet a young woman who's a freshman at OSU and still reaping the benefits of her time with the Oklahoma 4-H program. Maddie Canaday is a former Canadian County 4-H member who, much to her family's surprise, recently became an Oklahoma State University cowboy. My family growing up was all Oklahoma University fans and when we came for 4-H Roundup my very first year, I kind of fell in love with the campus. I fell in love with just the people, and it was just really amazing. And so I decided that OSU was where I wanted to go. I came here and I knew it was my home. I was very shy at first, but with the help of the friends that I made and 
um, my 4-H educators and all of the people, just the volunteers, it truly made me who I am today. I know with her um, upbringing and um, being in, involved with all of the people that helped raise her in the 4-H family, I know that Maddie will succeed and do wisely and make great choices. 4-H is also benefiting Maddie financially. She's the recipient of two scholarships from the 4-H Foundation that she's using toward a degree in psychology. Maddie being the oldest is the one that's going off to college first, so this is also a learning experience for us. So when she applied for scholarships and um, you know, succeeded in getting those scholarships, it was very beneficial and helpful for our family that she's been able to um, acquire those. It's very nice to have because without that that's $2,000 that you have to come up with and you don't know where it's going to be. Without the 4-H Foundation providing those things for just typical 4-Hers like me, there wouldn't have been any possibility of that. Joining us now is Tom Mansky, our new Development Director for the Oklahoma 4-H Foundation. And Tom, as we just saw in the story, the benefits of 4-H last well beyond high school. Most definitely. The things that you see that 4-H provides, the life skills and the ability to go on into a college career and then take those skills that they learn throughout their high school and junior high years into the college and into the, the professional field is just unmatched anywhere else. Uh, the life skills of public speaking, of communication, of responsibility, and that leads in, of course, to the scholarships they're able to win through the project work that they do, community service, leadership. It's just phenomenal what 4-H can do for the kids. And let's talk a little bit about those scholarships. Uh, the the effort and the, the momentum is growing and, and really there's a, there's a lot of different availability of scholarships. The kids are able to win scholarships based on their project areas to begin with so that might be anything from photography to animal science and the, and the different like beef, sheep and swine, it might be family and consumer sciences no matter what. They take those scholarships and they go on to college and are able to apply those to the career within that project area. We're very lucky recently in the fact we've been able to build the scholarships in Oklahoma from about giving away 50000 to almost $80,000 this year. Our goal is to top within the next two to three years over $100,000 in scholarships for the kids through the 4-H program. And those scholarships are, are wide-ranging, correct, the, the financial contributions? Yes, those come from many different organizations, individuals, those come from family trusts, from all kinds of different entities, and they can apply them. A lot of them will apply them here at Oklahoma State University, but they can apply them at other universities as well, Oklahoma University, Tulsa, you'll see them, some of them go out of state, and so they're very diverse in how they're, how they're in the program. In addition to the scholarships, we also offer support for different programs such as the State Shooting Sports Program, the State ATV Safety Program, State 4-H Roundup. We have a lot of donors that really step up and support that program. We also have an opportunity to support teams as they go out and, uh, go out and uh, represent Oklahoma to the national contest such as the Food Showdown. And for someone who's interested in learning more about the foundation, just give you a call or seek you out? They can seek me out or I'm gonna be out in the state as the development director, I'm gonna be out and meeting people, talking to companies, talking to individuals, to families, to, to find support not only for the scholarship program, but for other programs as well, such as our ATV safety program, the state shooting sports team, to help teams travel to national contests, maybe it be livestock judging, horse judging, quiz, Bowl, uh, the food countdown, all the things like that. So yes, they can call the 4-H Foundation, ask for Tom or Jim, and we'll be glad to work with you. Okay, lots of great programs in Oklahoma 4-H, that's for sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Tom Mansky, thanks a lot. And for more information on the Oklahoma 4-H Foundation, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Months of September and October are the prime time to plant your cool season food plots for white-tailed deer. The primary cool season plant that we want to establish for white-tailed in the state of Oklahoma is wheat. It's cheap, it's easy to establish, uh, deer love it, and it's adapted to a wide variety of soil types. If you're going to establish uh, a wheat field, there's two ways, broadcast, and we do this at uh, rates of about 90 to 100 and 10 pounds of seed per acre or drilling and we do that at about 75 to 90 pounds of seed per acre and if you drill the seed it needs to be about a half inch deep. 
It's really important to establish an exclusion cage on your food plot. Now this is just a, a caged area. You can use uh, you know, some type of fencing material, whatever you've got handy to make a small plot, a few feet in diameter. And this will allow you to see how much forage you're producing, but also how much forage is being consumed by whitetails on the food plot. The plot uh, should be at least a half an acre, but really two to three acres is, is the kind of the bare minimum. Smaller than that, then deer usually consume the food plot really quickly and it's just not attractive for very long. As far as the shape of the food plot, don't worry too much about that. It's nice if they're adjacent to some type of cover, but the shape is really not that important other than if you start making really irregular shapes, it's very hard to manage that field with your implements. So plan your field uh, with keeping in mind the size of your implements that you're going to use. In other words, if you've got a 20-foot implement, then you probably want that field in some increment of 20 feet across. For more tips on how to manage food plots for whitetail deer, you can check out our new food plot guide that's found on the website. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time at Sunup. Thank you.